All right, let's pray. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Heavenly King, Comforter, Spirit of Truth, everywhere present and filling all things, treasury of blessings and giver of life, come and dwell within us. Cleanse us of all stain and save our souls, O gracious one. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Glory to Jesus Christ. Slave Jesu Christu. Thank you everyone for staying after liturgy for this talk. You know, we sit, you know, when we start praying uh, Great Vespers at 4.30, and then now we're approaching uh, almost seven o'clock, you know, it means we're putting a lot of time into being at church. But that's a good thing. That's a very good thing. So I want to begin by asking, what is a devotional prayer? What's a devotional prayer? We sometimes call them just devotions. Um, prayer to a particular saint. Prayer to a particular saint. Yep, that's part of it. What else? All right. So devotion refers to typically something that we pray privately. It is a private prayer or something that we include as part of our prayer rule. Now, those prayers can be liturgical. You know, we've talking about how people will pray privately the hours, for example, or the divine office. But there are also other ways that people pray. Uh, so think of some, what, what are some very popular devotions that people will normally say, you know, this is my go-to prayer, right, you know, in their private daily lives, you know, what do people normally think of? Even think of something from your own life, maybe some morning prayers, yep, great devotionals to pray morning prayers. What else? Evening prayers. <laughs> Evening prayers, yes. Prayer before a meal, yep. Prayer before a meal. Uh, you, Jerry, you had mentioned, uh, you, what was that? The rosary is a, probably the single most popular devotional prayer on the face of the planet is the Holy Rosary. You know, it gets a lot of good press. We might even think of novenas or another great example of devotional prayers. Uh, the Angelus, yep. Uh, the Angelus is prayed publicly, so it's one of those things that can be both liturgical or devotional. And we're going to see that there's sometimes some murky water uh, between there. You know, it's, a, it's a, some shades of gray. Um, the Divine Mercy Chaplet, again, another very popular devotional prayer. And these are all prayers that I see uh, in our churches. You know, uh, it's very common for people to pray the rosary before a divine liturgy. Or before the mat, or before the holy mass, but what is one thing that all of these prayers have in common? All of these devotions have in common. Asking forgiveness. You know, asking forgiveness. The, what was that? Yeah, you don't necessarily need a leader, and this is and this is by design, right? So the design of this is so that way you can pray it privately, you can pray it, pray it, you know, in you can pray it quietly. But um, the things that we've listed, most of these, uh, as said, you know, most of these, we get them from the Roman Catholic Church. The Roman Catholic Church has been very, uh, very good at talking about the private pieties and sharing that throughout the world. And even though in our particular church, we are not Roman Catholic, we are Byzantine Catholic, we are in communion with Rome, uh, we've also taken on a lot of those uh, particular pieties because they're very good pieties. You know, you know I, let's, if we think about the rosary, for example, right? You know, that is a prayer that is powerful. That is a prayer that has done a lot of good for a lot of people. You know, I just got back from vacation. I was visiting a friend of mine up in the Upper Peninsula, and we were driving in the car, and he said, you know, I've been going through a lot of stuff lately, and I am surprised just how much that by turning to even just a decade of the rosary, he said, even just a decade a day, that it works wonders. It's a powerful, powerful prayer. But what if I told you that in our Eastern Catholic churches, 
In our Byzantine Catholic Church, we have our own unique devotional pieties, things that come from our own background as Eastern Catholics, as Eastern Christians, things that we also contribute. Who can think of something unique, a unique devotional practice that is particular to our Eastern churches? The Jesus Prayer, yeah, and we'll talk a little bit about that later. What else? Well, hopefully we can talk a little bit more about that. In the same way that people differ physically, mentally, and personally, so do people often differ in their personal approaches to piety and spiritual growth. While the church emphasizes the necessity for public prayer in the lives of believers to unite us with the one true faith, she also recognizes that we are all individuals with our own particular ways of strengthening our relationship with God. In our past sessions, we have spoken much on the public life of prayer in our church, such as the sacraments, the services like the divine office or the divine liturgy, so on and so on, so on. These are services and sacraments which services and sacraments, excuse me, which the whole church is either obliged to participate in or are encouraged to participate in for greater public spiritual edification while also so what been and while we've mostly and while we've talked a lot about that we have only kind of lightly touched on the need for those personalized approaches to our spiritual lives but today we will talk more in depth about those personalized devotions in our spiritual lives which are particular to the spirituality fostered in our byzantine tradition so while we often and rightly emphasize the oneness of our small o Orthodox Catholic faith, we must never forget that that faith has many unique expressions. While liturgical prayer or the public prayer is, prayer is designed to enforce the more common aspects of our Christian spiritual life, devotional prayer is designed to appeal to the particular needs and the spiritual lives of us as individuals. While we might often see people praying these publicly, they are usually not formally promulgated as part of the church's public prayer, but are encouraged to be prayed regularly in the home or as often as one is able to pray them out in the world. Perhaps the most ubiquitous devotional prayer that we can see, and we already spoke, we can see are things like the Holy Rosary, uh, things like uh, the Divine Mercy Chaplet, novenas, all sorts of things like this. And again, while we have these popular pieties, and as Eastern Catholics, there's nothing wrong with us praying these pieties. I mean, again, they are powerful, powerful prayers. You know, if, if, if there were enough time in the day, or enough time in the year, or enough time in one's life to hear about the great effects worked by the Divine Mercy Chaplet, or worked by the praying of the Rosary, you know, there just isn't. There just isn't enough time. It's, they're that powerful. But that said, that being said, <clears throat> said, we have more in our daily and personal spiritual toolbox than just the things that we have imported from the West. Things that are potent and powerful even of themselves. Things so potent and powerful that we've had numerous past pontiffs re-urged, so when I say pontiff, I of course mean popes. Popes and councils have urged our Eastern Catholic churches to return to these, to take a look at them again and not substitute them and find more room, more room for them in our daily spiritual lives. These include special prayer services, ascetic disciplines, and even the venerations of saints who are particularly connected to our regional tradition. So we spoke about uh, St. Theodosius of the Monastery of the Caves today. He is a saint that is very particular to our Eastern Christian tradition. Uh, we might think of uh, St. Gregory Palamas, who for the longest time was never commemorated in the West. Just 
was never. Now he uh, now he's kind of. I don't think he's formally on church calendars, but they do recognize his sainthood. Uh, we'll talk a little bit of uh, the great Russian mystic Saint Seraphim of Serov later on, but I need I digress. For our purposes today, we're going to focus on three major Eastern Christian devotional prayers: the prayer rope and the Jesus prayer, which someone said, which a few people had said. Akathist hymns and the Paraclesis are what we might call semi-liturgical devotional prayers, and the prayer rule of the Theotokos, which is becoming more and more popular, and when we start reading about it, you're going to say, hey, that sounds weirdly familiar, and but we'll get to that. So, perhaps the most recognizable feature of Eastern Christian personal piety is the use of the prayer rope, recitation of the Jesus prayer. You know, I've got this nice big 300 knot one that I got when I was in Italy. Oh, I could tell you, that poor nun that tied the thing. When I asked for it, she says, why do you need this? And I said, I, I, because I was a college student and I had more money than sense. So that's, that's why I have it. <laughs> and so now I have to pray it as often as I can. <laughs> It's called self-deprecating humor. While the focus of this tool of prayer is different than the rosary, which historical evidence shows us to have been in use in some form or another since the 9th century AD, the prayer rope predates it by at least 600 years. You'll often hear some people call the prayer rope the great granddaddy of the rosary or great grandmother, I suppose, are probably more appropriate. Uh, but in the same, but this is only insofar as that it uses kinetic and repetitive prayer. So when I say kinetic, I mean physical prayer. When you're physically moving the beads through your hands, this is a very important part of prayer. And it's actually a very important part of our spirituality where we're bringing in not just mental prayer, but we're also bringing in physical prayer physical motion, physical movement, that we can, there are certain things that we can touch. And by touching those things, those things help us grasp God better. Help us grasp God better. And so this is how the rosary and the prayer rope are similar. They're both ropes, they're both used for counting prayers, and they both have that kind of kinetic aspect, kinetic repetition. That's how they're similar, but they differ widely in their focuses. Tradition holds that the knotted prayer rope was revealed to St. Macarius the Great of Egypt by an angel after the devil continued to disrupt his rule of prayer. So he would be sitting down and he would count Jesus' prayers by picking up little pebbles that, was around, that were around him because he's in the desert and that's all that's around you are little pebbles and grains of sand, right? And so the devil would basically come up and knock them all out of his lap and he goes, ha ha, you don't know how many of those you've prayed. What are you going to do about it now? Because, you know, the devil is a petty child, apparently, right? And so Macarius became frustrated, and an angel appeared to him and showed him the secret of tying a knot, a knot that had a very intricate cross formation. So if you've ever learned how to tie prayer ropes, uh, Pani Janine actually knows how to tie them, uh, and, and she can attest to you they're very difficult. You can get into a rhythm but it's a very intricate knot, and it uses kind of overlapping cross patterns. And the reason it does this is, first of all, the symbolism of the cross, and second of all, it's a prayer that is so complicated. It is so complicated that the devil, in all his wits and all his wiles, is not able to undo them, or so the legend goes. So this is what's going on in the prayer rope. While in the rosary we say the Hail Mary, we say a litany of prayers, the prayer rope is said, specifically to be used for the Jesus prayer, or Jesus Christ, Son of the living God, have mercy on me, a sinner. This is sometimes called a hesychasm. And by the repeating of this prayer, it's actually very, in, it's actually very deep in what it's trying to accomplish. We talked a little bit about kinetic uh, prayer, right? That by feeling the beads, that helps us grasp the prayer more. The Jesus prayer is actually designed to sync with our breath as we breathe and to sync with our heartbeats. Why? Because when you say this prayer enough, syncing it to your breath, syncing it to your heartbeat, the very physiological, natural movements of your body, breathing, beating heart, 
these start, you start to associate with the prayer. And so as you breathe and as your heart beats, you are praying. The goal of this is to achieve, as St. Paul describes, to pray without ceasing. To pray without ceasing. That's what's going on in the Jesus prayer. And again, you're also meditating on the holy name of Christ. So this prayer is also fairly customizable for people that, that are at different levels. So there are different kinds of chotkis you can get. Uh, typically, they are they are knotted at 25 knots, or not, excuse me, not 25, they're knotted at 33 knots, one for each year of Christ's earthly life. Or 50 knots, 100 knots, 300 knots, or even 500 knots. And so Chotki or Kambaskini are used to, are then designed personally. They're designed for the person who is personally going to use them. Though, of course, you can go to like a little shop and buy, you know, any run-of-the-mill one if, you know, anyone's planning on going to Mount Macrina anytime soon. Not that anyone would be going to Mount Macrina anytime soon. Hint, hint. What close is coming up? We should all go. <laughs> so... That's the prayer rope. And this is probably why it's one of the most popular and probably best known. Uh, and that's probably one of the reasons why it's the most, one of the most well-known Eastern Christian pieties. Next, we have Akathist hymns and the Paraclesis. Now, I've talked about these as semi-liturgical hymns, uh, semi-liturgical semi uh, devotions. So the Eastern traditions of Christianity are, are best, perhaps best known for our liturgical prayer. You know, when uh, either a Roman Catholic who's never been, who's never seen our churches before, or a Protestant, or you know, someone just from the outside, they come in. The thing that most wows them is the liturgy. You know, we've, uh, you know, there's the great story from the uh, Chronicle of the Monk Nestor, sometimes called the Russian Primary Chronicle, if you're Russian, and called the Chronicle of Nestor by literally everybody else, uh, talks about how the Kiev, people of the Kievan Rus were converted to Christianity because of the divine liturgy. There was such beauty and majesty in it that they said that they did not know whether they were in heaven or on earth, but knew only that God dwelt with these people. So we're pretty well known for how we do, uh, for how we pray in public. Because of that potent public prayer life, it often finds itself in our personal prayer lives. And we actually often will design personal prayers to imitate our public prayer, the public prayer life, or even directly take inspiration from public prayer life. So we've heard, who's heard of an Akathist hymn before? Or who's heard of the Paraclesis before? That one's probably a little less well known. So these are each hymns that, these are each services that are designed, that are designed based on simple outlines from the service of morning prayer or matins. So the Akathist hymn, the hymn that, the, the song of not sitting, that's, uh, so akathi, it comes from the Greek word akathistos, meaning not to sit or to be said standing, is basically just going through the canon that you would read at matins. But that canon structure is now situated to focus directly on a particular subject, a particular saint, Christ himself, or some sort of holy figure. So the most famous one of these is, of course, the Akathis to, uh, our, to the Virgin Mother of God. But there are other Akathists to our Lord Jesus Christ, to the Holy Cross. Uh, there, you know, the, there's, an or, there's an Orthodox monastery in Jordanville, New York, I want to say, they publish a great big book of Akathists, and they just compile all these different Akathists that people have put together. You also have the service of the Paraclesis, or the calling upon of the Paraclete. What, who knows what the Paraclete is? Specifically, specifically the Holy Spirit, the Comforter, Holy Spirit, Spirit of, Spirit of Truth, Comforter, Spirit of Truth, we pray. And so when we are in times of great distress or duress, the paraclesis is a service that calls upon the comforting notion of the Holy Spirit and the Mother of God to come and be with us in those times of turmoil. Uh, when I was a young college student, uh, we, had our, we had our Metropolitan Andrzej Szeptycki Fellowship uh, that we had at the school. 
the only Eastern Catholic church around was a Ukrainian church. So we focused on Ukrainian things. Uh, but whenever midterms or finals came around, especially in cram week, uh, I would uh, actually lead a reader's service of the paraclesis for all those students who were under a lot of duress and stress getting ready for their finals and writing papers and su such. And I actually, I remember the, uh, one, of the, one of the deans came up to me and uh, he and I had had a bit of friction uh, before in the past. I don't remember why, don't ask me why. But uh, he actually came up to me and he was, and he said, no, thank you for doing this because the people really need this. And people came, you know, people came for this because when we're in trouble, turning to the Holy Spirit, turning to the Mother of God is a great prayer. And this is why it can be a great devotional tool. Finally, the prayer rule of the Theotokos. Quick show of hands, who's heard of this? The prayer rule of the Theotokos. Vaguely, vaguely somewhere. Yeah, yeah it's a great prayer rule. So the story goes that back in the 8th century AD, so actually around the same time that the rosary as we know it was being consolidated and being turned into uh, what we know. I mean, the final product of the rosary, of course, as we know, the pious legend Thomas sa says that it came in 1214 to St. Dominic, right? But uh, the mother of God did show herself to Christians in a manner did show herself to other did show herself to Christians in the eighth century and gave them a method for how they can turn to her in prayer. While this tradition certainly solidified into the Rosary as we know it, as it was given to Saint Dominic by Our Lady of the Rosary in 1214, this tradition would prominently solidify in the East under Saint Seraphim of Saroth between the 18th and 19th century. So actually, pretty late. The prayer rule consists of, and I'll stop me if you've heard this, it consists of 150 angelic salutations to the Mother of God, divided into 15 decades. Uh, before the introduction of the luminous mysteries, how many mysteries of the Mother of God are there? There's three, right? And how many mysteries are in each? Yeah. This is starting to sound an awful lot like the rosary, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> and basically is. Its resemblance to the Holy Rosary and its original three mysteries is uncanny. And it's no wonder that this relatively recent devotional formulation started to gain lots of traction in Eastern Christian communities. Because basically you have what is the Eastern Christian version of the Rosary. You know, put a, you know, put a little Byzantine cross on your Rosary and call it good, you know. So some concluding, so we could talk more and more about lots of different devotions that we find in our Eastern Christian churches. As much as we need the collective public prayer of the church, we must not lose sight of the fact that the church, the body of, which is the body of Christ, is made up of many parts. You all know that, uh, that, that, that hymn, you know, we are many parts. No, I don't remember this. It, it makes me cringe a little bit, but, you know, I remember it, but I remember it, and I will never forget it, I guess. <laughs> Not my cup of tea. But we are, it is made of many parts, though. Each part requires nourishment that is not just pick, applicable to the body in general, but is also applicable to its specific needs, right? As Pope St. John Paul the Great, Patriarch of the West, so rightly noted in Orientale Lumen, you know, everyone quotes this constantly, but I'm going to quote it again, the church must learn to breathe with both her lungs, speaking of those traditions that come from the West, as well as those traditions that come from the East. Our devotional prayer lives, while fully customizable to our particular needs as individuals, needs to remember our unique identity as Eastern Christians as well. Our churches provide a necessary expression of the universal, of the universal faith that is unique to us. And that expression is fueled as much by our private devotional lives as it is in our public liturgical lives. The external life is informed by the internal life. We've all probably heard this, right? What you do, there's sometimes we think that the things that we do in private, people will never know. 
but if anyone that's ever been married, they will be able to tell you, you know, that when they're having a good married life, right? When you have a spousal couple that's supporting each other and being good in their private lives, that emanates out in how they carry themselves publicly. And those families where they're not having a very good marriage, you know, where they're just kind of putting up a facade, it becomes very clear that they're putting up a facade, right? And that things aren't always all right at home. What happens in our private lives, even if not seen clearly, is still seen in our public life. Same thing too in our prayer. If our prayer is not, you know, if, you know, the same thing too in our prayer. If we're not, first of all, if we're not having a genuine private prayer life, you know, our public prayer life is just going to be kaput. You know, it doesn't matter what you're doing. But also, if we are emphasizing things in our tradition, our tradition is going to shine all the more brightly. If we emphasize things that make us in communion with not just ourselves, but also the church at large, that is also going to shine all the more brightly, you know. So, this, like, I, I want to make clear this isn't a talk about we need to stop praying the rosary and start praying the uh, prayer rule of the Theotokos. It's not what I'm getting at. What I'm getting at, though, is that we have many other things that we can be praying and that we should that we should explore and investigate because these are things that come from our tradition. These are things that are unique to us, and these are things to be honored to have. And they present great spiritual benefits to those that pray them. I invite you all then, if you have not already incorporated, if you haven't already incorporated them into your rule of devotional prayer at home, some prayer that is unique to our Eastern Christian spiritual life. Maybe that's a particular saint of our church like uh, St. Pantelemon, who we generally return to in times of uh, need for health, right? Because he, uh, he was an unmercenary healer. Maybe you, maybe you want to turn to St. Theodosius of the Monastery of the Caves. Not sure why you would, but you could, <laughs> right? <laughs> but maybe it's that. Maybe it's start praying the Jesus prayer more. Maybe it's read an Akathist every now and again. Maybe take some time, read a little bit from the canon of Matins. See what it does to your prayer life, to your life in the church, and your relationship with God and his saints. And I promise you that you will not be disappointed. Any questions? All right, then we'll end with... A prayer to the Mother of God, in the, name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. It is truly proper to glorify you, O Theotokos, as the ever blessed and immaculate and the Mother of our God, more honorable than the cherubim, and beyond compare, more glorious than the seraphim who a virgin gave birth to God the Word. You truly, the Theotokos, we magnify. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Glory to Jesus Christ. Slave, the Christu.